I'm happy to see everybody here. Uh, I'm really excited um, that we're starting to kind of transition out of um, kind of more theor theoretical or um, kind of more scriptural aspects of, of Buddhism in relationship to environmentalism and ecology. And I, I feel like we're now moving in, in the book into a uh, more practical application of environmental, environmentalism and ecology for our, ourselves. And this week, uh, our, our topic was um, the religion of consumerism. And in this particular chapter, uh, it had, uh, it, this wasn't really the only good juicy bit that was in there, uh, because it was about globalization, population, and development. And one of the things I thought was interesting, especially with the, the text that um, I picked on this religion of consumerism, it, it's just this notion of how the author looked at this the human condition in the lens through the lens of Buddhism, this uh, the, the truths. And so last Sunday when I was talking for the Dharma talk, I really wanted to share this notion of the four noble truths with the first two truths being um, the uh, the truth of suffering and the cause of suffering or the, or the origin of suffering. Because what the author really does uh, do in his, his talk is he he demonstrates how uh, Western, uh, you might even say kind of uh, American uh, consumerism has really uh, gone or targeted the three poisons of attachment, aversion, and uh, ignorance or delusion. Uh, and, and what was interesting with the article that I, that I found was just this notion of someone who's seen this transition of, of Thailand, especially like Bangkok, kind of from a traditional culture into uh, this, this very westernized, uh, capitalistic uh, culture. And he shared a little bit of the history of why that type of um, consumerism uh, arose in Thailand, this notion that um, there was a lot of pressure from foreign powers on the government of Thailand, so instead of be, you know, because they wanted them to open their markets and be available basically for, for globalization. And so instead of, uh, or seeing other countries uh, around them being uh, colonized, they basically just opened their doors and, and allowed themselves, uh, or allowed the foreign powers in. Uh, so they weren't so much colonized, but I would say their culture got colonized. Um, and so looking at that, he, he really was, uh, it, it almost felt like a lament um, when, when I was reading this. And one of the things he uh, talked about, and, and, just, and I don't think I shared this during the Dharma talk, but I thought I might share uh, here real quick, was just this, uh, at the end on 182, he says, consumerism also supports those who have economic and political power by rewarding their hatred, aggression, and anger. And consumerism works hand in hand with the modern educational system to encourage cleverness without wisdom. What I found really interesting with that is I, I was trying to, I was doing some uh, Google searching on just activities about consumerism because I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to maybe do some kind of activity to erase, you know, a, a, uh, arouse our awareness of it um, and everything I discovered was elementary level uh, some stuff for high school level but it was all about how to be a consumer <coughs> and I was like well there you go you know so when because at first I read that I was like educational system I, I don't get that at all but here was um, you know these kind of uh, study courses and these activities for teachers to teach kids how to be Consumers, smart consumers, you know, how to, how to, you know, sh shop for a sale kind of thing. And I thought, well, there it is. I mean, that, uh, he really had zeroed it in, you know, and then the other aspect of that, this notion that uh, it supports those who have economic and political power. In the email that went out, I shared a video um, of this professor who was talking about eco-apartheid. Uh, and when I was just doing some, just uh, 
YouTube videos and just looking at different aspects of mindfulness and Buddhism in relationship to ecology and environmentalism, this one came up. Uh, and, and at first I, I, I wasn't really going to use it, but then I started kind of, I, I, I watched another one and then I watched this one, which was much shorter. The other one was all about mindfulness and development, um, develop, uh, creating a, a mindful uh, society. But in that one, he talked about this eco-apartheid, which really struck me. And so the video that I found, it was just really a, a excerpt on that. Um, and in that video, if, if you hadn't watched it, what he talked about was, and, and I mentioned it last week, was in like Oakland area, I think uh, he calls it the Toxic Triangle, uh, this little part in California, where you could see on a map where the population of African Americans live. And in that same, those same dots on a map, you see uh, like smokestacks and other things that spew out toxic um, uh, smoke and other substances into the environment. Uh, he talks about, and, and I don't think he talked about it in this one, but he talked about it in the other talk, this notion of you look at Oakland and how many uh, grocery stores do they have? And you see the map and it, they're all over the place, but when you really look at those numbers, they're not grocery stores, what they are is the mini marts and the liquor stores. So they're selling a lot of alcohol, but they're also not selling a lot of groceries. What they're doing is they're selling junk food. Uh, the grocery items they do have are expired or aren't really good quality. I saw another video where they were interviewing uh, kids in those neighborhoods and the kids were like, no, I would never buy the stuff off their shelves. Um, so, that, you know, what's happening is in these, this kind of economic structure, especially in consumerism, the haves and the have-nots are through kind of systematic uh, rules or policies or just uh, methods, they are creating this, really this apartheid, this, this strong divide between communities. What I found interesting with this video was because he was looking at it here in, in our quote-unquote developed country, yet you, you go from one block into this other area. And again, Oakland only really had one grocery store for the entire area. Everything else is kind of a food desert in a sense. So you go from one block that's very affluent and has a lot of the stuff and you see this consumption mindset where people are consuming at such a great, uh, at a great pace and then you go a few blocks and you see the have-nots and the people who, due to systems and legislation, have been marginalized, who can see the haves across the street. And so they are just, a, it, just as much impacted by that consumer drive. You know, the, the ads that we watch are very targeted towards uh, buying things and, and uh, the greed and attachment aspect. Um, and then, you know, they, you, you see it in music, you see it in advertising, you even see it in movies. I remember I uh, used to read to my daughter and she got to this certain age where she started getting into like the preteen novels and stuff like that. And it was just all product placement and through that entire book. It was about, oh, how so-and-so had their Gucci bag and would go to this and that. And I didn't understand most of the products they were, they were talking about and it was, it was so blatant and so just in your face about it. Uh, and I, can, I could see her kind of think, oh, I need to have the Gucci bags and I need to have this, you know? And it's like, it's that old adage, you've got uh, caviar champagne and caviar dreams on a Mad Dog 2020 budget that you're, you know, you have these lofty ideals, but you can't, you're living above your means. And so because people are pushed a little above their means, all of a sudden now they're having to find alternate ways to create money. So then you have uh, this entire economy around debt. Um, you have the payday loans and the, the other loan places that have extraordinary uh, percentage rates, you know? Uh, and people are, are, even just to have food, have to, you know, 
you know, sub substance have to uh, get caught up in these traps. And so, not only can we see that e that eco apartheid in our own country, but especially when you read a chap, you know, the chapter that we were had today, and, and the next one that he talked about, development as if people matter, you see this uh, big eco apartheid even in you know versus first world countries and third world countries that. Um, you know, you have the source of these raw materials, and if you're not in power, your life doesn't matter. That, and you can see that with like the Amazon, uh, with the indigenous tribes that are in the Amazon, how they're, you know, uh, they're uh, the advocates and the activists who stand up for them have been murdered. How just they've been displaced, all because people want the either the wood or they want the land for for cattle to graze. So. It's a, it, it is a real issue. Um, and I thought instead of me just sitting here waxing and waning about, oh, how terrible it is, uh, instead I thought maybe today we would do something practical and, and discuss and brainstorm just a list of things that we could do to reduce our consumerism and consumption. And maybe we'll take, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, just to brainstorm, just throw out all the ideas. And then we would just break up into groups and maybe have a couple people take the first couple of items. Or if there's anything that really stands out as something that we can do, then as a group, come up with what, what can we do, practical steps that from today forward, can we actually implement in our lives? You know, because I don't think we could sit there, you know, if you say, oh, you should go zero waste, that's a great idea, but is that really a practical idea for, for everybody? Um, so things to think about, you know. So I thought maybe what we could do is brainstorm. Um, and I know uh, Vicki brought something to share, so we'll actually, I think that's an important thing that kind of comes into this piece because we talked a little bit about recycling uh, last week. Um, and so I just, did you want to share, since we're all here now, on your recycling? that you had talked about? Well, in one class we had talked, somebody had mentioned that there was a way to recycle styrofoam. So I looked it up, and um, all styrofoam is not recyclable, but this molded, uh, there are, it's, um, there are these styrofoam molds that they use for packing, like if you buy a television set or a sewing machine, or there's, you see it in a lot of large um, things that have been shipped. But uh, these molds and blocks and styrofoam coolers can be recycled. And they have to have, uh, there's this six here, I'll pass this around so everybody can see how this is, is stamped, and the place that you can uh, recycle is ACH Foam Technologies at 1400 North 3rd Street. So, anyway. Um, 14 what? 1400 North 3rd Street. I'll just pass this around. Casey Mo? Yeah. Okay. So what are, I think that's a great start. So our first thing is up there, uh, recycling molded styrofoam. Um, what are some other things that we can do? Uh, and I'm gonna say consumerism slash consumption because I think sometimes those can go hand in hand. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> something that comes out from maybe not the direction we were going to think of. I know Sharice Davis, who's uh, the state or the representative uh, from my district, Congress, she actually has uh, legislation up right now that would force drug companies to disclose the cost of their drugs and their ads. And I think that legislation, supporting legislation uh, that would be able to combat some of the psychological warfare that takes place inside of advertising that promotes consumerism. You know, I mean, the, the reality is is that that these advertising agencies and, and governments and other people have, have taken, you know, the manipulation of our own uh, you know, 
those subconscious motivations and, and honed it to a, a you know, perfected science and being able to motivate people to, to consume, you know, to, to plant these ideas in our heads that these are things that we do need and that this is the behavior that we do, just like the product placement of the books and things like that. You know, I mean, I think that, uh, that supporting legislation that, that, you know, would start to regulate that kind of behavior is flexible with their bending of the truth when it comes to advertising. You know, um, again, I, I tend to believe that a lot of these kind of issues on a large scale like this, it's going to take legislation to really get a lot of that stuff moving in the right direction as much as, you know, as well as individual responsibility. But I know specifically that like, when hearing about that legislation, I really, really caught my ear fact that she's going to force because a lot of people who see these drug ads they don't realize how expensive you know Humira or whatever like I work in the insurance agent, the industry and the, the monthly expense for like Humira is insane and so much of it isn't even covered by a drug company but these people don't realize how when they get their doctor try to get a prescription the next thing you know they're, they're strapped with this debt that's just insane for a drug that they probably don't Okay. So, so supporting legislation, targeting consumers, any other? Consuming less TV generally, because it is that greed that gets thrown at you all the time through ads. And maybe for our resources, uh, if it's not already on there, the quiz you sent out from um, Drawdown was excellent. And it brought up like what, what really is the bang for your buck when it ter when it comes to um, these ego changes? Okay. So uh, I think the legislation is, is very true, but we also have to kind of educate ourselves so we, we know, okay, are they just making up some stuff or is this really the most effective policy as well? So I think there's some education we can give in supporting people. So can we also say instead of TV uh, only, also uh, just media and social media? Because yeah. you know, print media, you see ads, social media, they target ads based off of your search yeah. history. Um. <clears throat> There's a way you can, and uh, I think it's a Huffington Post article of how you can reduce the mail that comes to you, mm -hmm. especially like the junk mail that you get. It's also called like third class mail. Um, you, there's one company that you can pay like two dollars to to get you off a lot of these lists, um, and then you may have to reach out to certain individual like places. If you, for example, if you donated to uh, the Red Cross, they're going to keep sending you paper mailings again and again until you tell them not to. So if you've reached out to them and you want to stop having more, you know, paper stuff sent to you, but I did that and that's started to help. Um, so you don't just pick up your mail and dump it in the recycling bin. So it's nice and you, do you know who that is? Um, I can add it to our resources list. Um, there's a phone number and then there's a website that um, that I used when I googled just how to how to get off these lists. So I can I can send that on. Sure. And so I'm going to speed us up a little bit. We don't have to explain it. We're just going to throw out ideas and then we'll break into groups and explain have the explanations. Uh, so what else can we do? We can I, um, I'm looking at it from a personal point of view. And I um, read a book about um, well, this two people who did it. It's a, it's a uh, best-selling book, but I forget their names now. But anyway, it's about you know how to spend. And um, one of the things they emphasize is how much is enough. That on a personal level, we have to determine how much is enough. And um, you know, and I remember being in a, you're in a scarcity mode, then you, you want to get more before everybody else you know, takes it. So I'm thinking, how much is enough? Okay. So spending below your means, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, other, oops, other thoughts? I, I've been thinking about, uh, I'm going to need a new car eventually.
eventually produce. Okay. So I'm thinking, um, you know, a hybrid vehicle that gets like two or three times the gas mileage that I get now. If I had an electric source, I would go for an electric car, I think. Although, I'm not sure that that really saves as much gas as I think it does. But anyway, okay. just the, that type of idea. Mm -hmm. And thinking about um, more solar, uh, you know, just investigating solar options. There's a lot of solar energy around Oregon that I saw. People mm -hmm. heating their, their houses with solar energy panels. Okay. And yes. What do you mean if you had an electric source, you would get an electric car? What did you mean by that? I live in an apartment, so I don't have a garage, so I don't have a plug. Oh, okay. okay. That's I mean, a, that's about your rent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. electricity. Is so right. Well, <laughs> but that's, a, that's another example of this kind of, uh, in a sense, that uh, that divide that, you know, if you live in an apartment or a, um, like a housing unit, you don't, you, you are relegated to a more traditional, even a hybrid with still gasoline. Or uh, I have to find a, a station. There are these, there's more and more of those right. plug-in stations. But Vicki, did you have? Um, at the beginning of the year, as, as kind of a resolution thing, I looked up how to, um, how to reduce my own consumerism. And uh, the, the recommendation was before you buy anything, First, you ask, do I really need this? Mm -hmm. Is there something that I already have that can uh, do the same job as or, or replace? And uh, is is if I if I buy this thing, is there something that I can um, take out of my environment? Can I um, can I get rid of something else instead of adding more, you know, to my conglomeration? You know, can I? Is there something that I can give away or get rid of? Yep. Uh, vegetarianism, veganism, locally sourcing your your you know daily necessities. Uh, cutting down or removing any kind of, you know, extemporaneous chemical enjoyment like blues or cigarettes or anything like that. And then being broke, so you don't have the money to spend it. <laughs> no, all of those things pertain to me. <laughs> and, and another thing is, is not to use shopping as a source of entertainment. Yeah. yeah. Retail yeah. therapy. Yeah. Oh, it's just work. <laughs> So let's, um, we're at 8.14. I want to make sure we have plenty of time. Um, and then cutting out um, booze. Thrifting <laughs> <laughs> next to don't do retail. Uh, don't do retail, OK. Like thrift shopping. Thrift. Thank you. 
are amazing and did a much better job than I ever did. I'm just going to combine some of these just so we We have consuming. Let's give you guys the earth color, green. Uh, what was it? How much is enough? Yeah, thank you. And what was the third one? Uh, thinking about all impact. Yeah. Was that the other one? Okay. All right, Nora. Let me bring it back up. There you go. I know it's kind of sorry. Whatever you choose, whatever's left, left in the last group. Okay. Do I really need this? Okay. Uh, don't do retail thrifting. Okay. What was that? Ah, uh, she said, don't do retail thrifting as entertainment. They are going to be our blue team. Uh, 
do I uh, hybrid vehicles? Blue and Okay, and so let's, we're gonna cut out the drawdown quiz because that's something we can do. So let me just pull that one out there. Um, so we have, let's cut out the booze because that's not related to the remacer. Oh, it is, maybe. It's more like, I'll never tell. Extemporaneous spending. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's one that we won't talk about. Which one do you not want to talk about? What's well, next? There is recycling, reducing mail that comes to you, getting off mail lists, reducing plastic consumption, teaching children how to consume by modeling it. Oh, well, let's see. What's that? You don't have any choice. Okay, I tell you what, I'll make these. Yeah, that can be kind of comes to you. Yeah, let's we'll take that. that Okay. That's right. Okay, so let's break in our groups. Ones, twos, threes, and since I'm over here, fours. Okay, so let's start with our red team, team one. Uh, you had, I believe this is right, team one had the red? Yeah. Supporting legislation that targets consumerism. Uh, vegetarian, vegan diet, local sourcing. Those were your three. You had a chance to. Who was on your team? Um, yeah. Ron and Laura. Okay, so which one did you pick that you want to share? Uh, we didn't actually pick one. No, we didn't. Uh, yeah, pick one. We. Which one did you have the most fun discussing? <laughs> we had action steps on two. Um, on number two? On the vegetarian diet and then the supporting legislation. We kind of had action steps. Okay. So maybe the legislation, um, Ron okay. gave a number of um, nonpartisan groups that we could be aware of on a personal level. Okay. Um, all on the line. All on the line, that's a group? It's a gerrymandering Jerry awareness Jerry. and an activist uh, group. Um, Citizens <coughs> Climate Lobby. And um, the Catholic Climate Covenant. 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 Catholic Climate Covenant. 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 So, um, what was that first? I mean, the all on the line. All of the citizens. Uh, citizens Climate Lobby. Yeah, Citizens Climate Lobby. And I'd also mentioned um, uh, just the League of Women Voters as, as source. All those being kind of sources of. Um, like knowing who you're voting for and oh, what you're yeah. voting about. So you could possibly look into joining one of those or being aware. Um, on the remay level, we could consider reaching out to the local representative of where we own land now, yeah. um, just to um, be in touch, have them know our face, um, be aware of who, you know, who, what they're about. And maybe we could help educate them and vice versa hold them accountable was one thing Ron mentioned that it's not only about knowing who you're electing but also like asking them and following up like did you do the things you promised okay as an organization or as individuals um it could be both really okay. um on the vegetarian aspect we thought we could do cooking pop-up classes for new vegetarians or for vegetarian meals and then come up with um local vegetarian lists of, of restaurants we could support with our, especially when we have like out-of-town guests for retreats. Okay. We could let them know about Pirate's Bone and Cafe Gratitude and other places that we want to support. Okay. Sure. Yep, that's us. Okay. Just a comment about the you know, regulation of business. Uh, business uh, used to be, it used to be the attitude that you have to watch business and Make sure capitalism by itself, unregulated, has always considered, as far back as I can remember until recently, that it's not a good thing. Uh, that capitalism is not something to uh, guide your life. It's important, it's there, it's what we have to live with, and it's fine as long as it's regulated and combined with values, directed by values that we have. Consumerism in itself. Uh, to me, 
needs to be regulated by the government because consumerism uh, comes from business and business needs to be regulated because they, they practice unfair business practices and devastate the environment for profit. And, uh, and uh, so basically we, we, we need to take the attitude of greater regulation of business in government. We need to go back to that. Something might be lost. Somehow we, I, I've heard religious groups say that the market system is the will of God. The free market system, unregulated market system is the will of God. And that's their new religion. I've heard that a lot of people say that. This is, this is the will of God. This is what God wants. And God appointed Trump. <laughs> yeah, this is this is how crazy it's got. Uh, All right, so let's. It's uh, <laughs> a nice thing to follow up. Okay. Uh, what about? I think group two is our green group. All right. All right. So we had consuming less TV media, social media. How to spend, how much is enough, thinking about the impact of alternative energies, and of those three, which ones did you want to pick? I'll um, choose how much is enough. Okay, how much is enough? So we uh, came up with a few ideas. Okay. Um, the main one was uh, on a personal level, like shopping lists, making a shopping list and sticking to it um, really helps reduce unnecessary consumption and spending. Yeah, don't stores put those end caps, you know, yeah. the impulse buy right there when yeah. you're ready to check out. It's all, that's all formula, formulaic. Very formulaic, yeah. Um, and stuff like meal preps. Okay. Meal planning and prep? Yeah. yeah. What about uh, at the remain level? Yeah, we need to do that. <laughs> You know, I would say, uh, and, I, and just to share, um, you know, the board, uh, this is one of the things that we talk about with like um, visiting teachers coming. You know, where it used to be the model would be, you know, it was a $150 suggested donation for an event. And, you know, we had, uh, you could pay what you wanted and, and do, you know, do work studies and stuff like that. But there's a stigma that gets put on to, even if you don't think there's a stigma, that person can say, oh gosh, you know, and, and just as a spiritual director, I, I know that people had that. Um, and so we, we thought, well, what's an alternative model? And that alternative model was the sponsorship that we do, you know, where we basically say $2,000, you know, is our goal for a visiting teacher that usually it's about 500 to $700, um, for like uh, overhead cost, like airfare and food if, if needed. And we try to reduce by having them stay with families and stuff like that. But, um, you know, so they're getting at least $1,000, if not more, um, depending on if we can reduce costs, you know. And we're very upfront with the teachers, like this is our model, you know. And we've had teachers say, no, thank you, that's okay, you know. But we also have had teachers that love that model because one of the things it does is when you find the sponsorship you know and everybody can contribute ten dollars twenty dollars maybe people who can afford more do more and what happens is then that you know how much is enough is stated right then and there like two thousand dollars is enough and then also the doors are now open to anybody who wants to come to the remain center to participate in an event uh, and then if you do want to give more, like a Donna, it's, it's not Donna to the Remake Center, the Remake Center is, it's you, you're giving it straight to the teacher because then there's a, a stronger connection that's made when you're expressing gratitude toward the teacher through a monetary gift, when you're actually like s sitting right in front of them, handing that tool. Um, we still do like cost for classes and stuff like that because it's a little cheaper uh, or the classes are less expensive but you know I think the, the sponsorship model is is a really wonderful and I think we tested it uh, last year was that our first year for for the entire year and every single teacher we met our goal 
Every single one, you know. I was yeah. so skeptical about that. I, you know, I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people, well, and a lot of people were because it's so different and it's so, and I wouldn't say it's new. It's actually the old model. It's um, benefactors would come together to sponsor a teaching so that everybody could come to the teaching. What happened was kind of that thing like capitalism crept in and then all of a sudden it, it I don't want to say twisted, but the model changed. And so we're, we're trying to, I don't want to say write this shit, but we're just using a different method. Uh, and the fact that it works, demonstrate, you know, people come who normally wouldn't be coming to it, you know, and, and I know some of the, the feedback was, well, and, and, I, and again, think about, because there's a strong, in our culture, if it doesn't have a, a price to it, it's valueless. Like it, it's the the weight of it is gone, right? And that's just the way our minds work. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the really expensive car. Well, that car's got some value, but that car's probably a piece of junk compared to maybe something that's less expensive. Who knows? But our value placement is because of dollar, and so it makes us have to look at that and say, what it, what actually constitutes value? And I would say especially here for teachings, what constitutes value is the positive impact on your life. That's, if that truly makes a positive impact, that's what holds value. You know, if you come and the teacher can't speak English and the translator's having a hard time and you walk away and you're like, oh, I didn't get anything out of that, then you, there wasn't a lot of value to that particular teaching. But if you came and you really connected with the teacher or the teachings, that, that's the value that we measure um, or, or are worried about here. Just, just, if you didn't mind me plugging the remix center there for a second. Okay, group three. Thank you, group, group uh, two. Group three, uh, we have uh, group three. Who's group three? So Nora, Vicky, and, uh, okay. So let's go um, buying hybrid vehicles. Uh, before buying, do I really need this? Is this something that I... There's something else I can replace it with. Uh, don't do retail thrifting as entertainment. Uh, did you all, were you all able to pick one that you? Well, we decided that the do I really need this was the one we would focus on. Okay. And, uh, that kind of, the other two were kind of captured in that, that one, I would say. That's a good. Well, especially the, the entertainment, mm -hmm. retail is entertainment. But um, just examples like, uh, Norris suggested that we just move to, to Fairbanks <laughs> and then it'd be too cold to go. It's too cold to shop. Too, go too to cold shop. to shop. We <laughs> <laughs> don't want to shop at 33 below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, she, and she gave up pancakes. McDonald's. I had to give up McDonald's pancakes. Oh, okay. okay. Because, it's game and because of the, the, the plastic and the, the food container. Mm -hmm. So. You know, giving up, uh, eating out, because that's entertainment. Fast food is, 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 even fast food is entertainment. But, but eating out is, uh, is one of those entertaining things. And also, um, um, I have started borrowing books from the library instead of buying books. You know, and that's, reading is entertaining. Didn't somebody raise last week about like a borrowing box or a borrowing closet where people like I have this thing that I don't need, but instead of throwing it out, I, other people can have it. Or something. Yeah, but, uh, it's, free box. it's a what? Yeah, the free box. Free box. Free bin. Free bin. And and I've also tried to uh, be more generous about um, loaning books that I already have. You know, trying to uh, pass them on and get them out of my house. And this, you know, I was, this was kind of a, a, unintentional, but I was cleaning out my closet, my clothes closet, and um, it took me a couple of days. It's, you know, it's not his fault, but I had a bunch of, of hangers that I had, 
in a pile on the floor. And my husband thought he was doing me a favor, and he took all my extra hangers and he tied them together with the with the the tie. And uh, so I, he didn't think about the clothes that I had in the laundry. So I don't have any clothes. I don't have enough hangers for all my clothes. So I decided just, um, okay, I have started, you know, making my closet to match my hangers instead of buying more hangers to fill up my closet. So um, it was an accident, but it made me think about, you know, about not needing so many clothes in my closet. What is it, Maria Kondo, the Cole yes, Marie method? Where it's very much Maria Kondo. Yeah. I, I try, you know, it was amazing because I had like an over full dresser and I did it and it was like, wow, that's, I was like, look, honey, look how amazing this is. Shouldn't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> My wife told me to stop watching Netflix. Yeah, thanks for the love. Yeah, give thanks for the piece of clothing. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to do it for her clothes, but she said no. <laughs> okay, so that's that's wonderful, uh, especially at the personal level that we can immediately start doing, really kind of questioning our, do I need this? Kind of like I talked in the Dharma talk, uh, and I talked about it in this book, having that pause, or I don't think it was in the book, it was in another yes. article, but just taking that pause, do I need it? I'm not going to buy it today, I'm going to wait a day or two, do I still need it? Then I'll go back to it. Or like, my hangers are gone. Now I, I can look and say, well, do I really, this thing, do I, do I need it? Um, what about here at the Remake Center? What, what's, um, do I really need this, something I can replace? Uh, is there a way that we can uh, apply that here at the Remake Center? Well, we already have a library, and it's very open. I mean, you don't have to have a library. Nope. In fact, our, our hope is that you keep the book. You can. Okay. I would rather you take books, but yeah. what, well, and the, the way our, our shelving is limited, but it's like a it's like one of those little lending libraries that you see out in the communities. It really is. You can bring books in if there's books that you don't want anymore, um, and if there's books that you want, you can take them. Um, I, r the rules are simple. You take it, keep it as long as you want. If you need to give it to someone else, great. If you do bring it back, please put it on the shelf where you found it, so I don't have to. I think you just said if you take if you take when you. Yeah, but if you bring one, you have to take one. And that's why I love Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough. We don't have enough hangers for the books. And, and, and remember, we're moving eventually. We are. Yeah. So please take a book. Maybe you should announce that on Sunday. Take a book. Uh, well, no, nobody really knows. I mean, some people don't know. Sure. Yeah. About the library. Yep. That's a good point. Some of us shouldn't. <laughs> I gotta tell you, when people donate books, though, I really enjoy going through those boxes. Like, Ooh, what goodies are? Oh yeah. You get that. You get that shopping high. You know, like, oh. I, can, I can bring my books and go. What? Disappear. Yeah. What? What? Yeah. Ten books do I not need to read? Though? I'm All sure right. we're gonna have to pare down the Remain Center with the move. You know. We are gonna have to There's pare. gonna be a little bit tighter space, and some of these things we can really question. Like, do we even use this? Marie Kondo, the remake center. Yeah, I think mean, we'll get there. Just don't have Gabby here. Actually, Gabby would be like, push it all out. Yeah. Get rid of it all. Oh, no. There may be people here in the community that can use some of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that would probably require a little bit of foresight as far as what things should go where and what this. Yeah. We could put a free table up of just like remake centers paring down. If any Sangha member could use this. Like take it with you, or mm -hmm. yeah, I mean the community as well um, that we're heading toward. That's true. And All right. Yeah. No, one no. other thing that came up was uh, to develop some coping strategies to, to substitute for um, the the less consumer. You know. Did Did you guys have an example of a coping strategy? Um, to counteract that antidote to... We ran out of time. Okay. Meditation. 
the group, <laughs> but in, in when we were talking about that, we were also talking about forty percent of the food is wasted. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. And with our own <coughs> waste. And uh, just being like with the specific waste that she had, as far as the, the closet, you know, being in, you guys kind of already took the wind out of the sails as far as the, making sure you stick to, to what you need and not not go overboard. You know, a little bit of foresight. What is it that I really need as opposed to, I, I know I'm bad about being tired walking into the grocery store and I'm hungry and just being like, ha, ha. Yeah. Knowing, knowing how much money I can spend but not specifically what I'm looking for, you know, and so often I'll, I'll get pretty close to that amount of money that I can spend as opposed to what it is that I'm really, you know, being able to use that foresight to, to be able to budget during the week and instead of, you know, getting a, a ready-made meal I can just throw the microwave or the other. Mm -hmm. That, you know, getting the materials that would allow me to prepare myself a meal in that moment and then meal for the next day and meal for the next day. Which may sound like common sense to a lot of people, but for a knucklehead like myself, that requires a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those kind of things. Like, that can add up in a lot of ways, and, and not allowing those, those you know, coping mechanisms or those tendencies and just going in and grabbing whatever is available and not dealing with it and not spending the time to, to go into it with a, a conservation minded. Uh, group number four, uh, we're kind of coming to the end. Uh, we had uh, recycling, uh, and, and we took took not just the recycling molded styrofoam, but we talked recycling in general, um, and then uh, reducing plastic consumption. And then uh, our third one was teach children how to consume by modeling it. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak just, I think we decided to teach children how to consume by modeling it because I think those other two fall into that one. Um, and specifically, we spoke about um, the fact that kids do get a lot of pushback from media and, and uh, kind of the world around them that uh, we really need to, to not just say it, but actually demonstrate it. And, and uh, you know, working with recycling, working with uh, reducing plastic consumption, uh, and just have them see it. And, and I know I kind of shared just a story of, you know, my granddad would mute the commercials in between uh, television, and uh, so he wouldn't be kind of bombarded by that. Um, what, uh, I, I don't recall, uh, what other, aspect, am I missing anything from that, that last one? For those that were in our group, modeling it for the children. The only, the only thing I want to add to that is that you see, a lot of these things are uh, they're subjective. So you about what is enough is different from culture, different historical times, and also different families. See, so we learn those things, and if we learn from the media, then, oh, sorry, we are learning from our parents. Or but these are subjective. Just to give you an example, is why I to throw out all these books. Any book that you have to touch into your music. And nobody could defend it. But I said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, books are like pictures. So he doesn't think he's not a horror. So you don't throw away your pictures. You know, he just has to have a library. But I grew up, we had a library. That's why I had it. We had a dictionary in every room. See, so it's not, it's just not, you know. So he's going to say it's subjective. See, it's defined, they give you the reasons why you're doing it. You're doing. So you know, it's not just uh, arbitrary. Uh, but if, you, if, but if, if it goes to the media, then you lose all. Well, I think too, um, we didn't, this didn't come up, it just came up in my mind, that uh, I think parents will um, give stuff or games or things when they really could just give them some quality time, you know, <laughs> doing something together, cooking something together, or going on a hike, you know. So maybe just changing that mindset of, instead of giving them another thing that they're gonna just, you know, toss in about an hour. <laughs> Well, you better do it than they're young because as they get older, they're very young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would say, uh, you know, that's for the personal aspect with children and things like that, but I also think on the organizational, like the Remay Center, the community, you know, uh, re getting rid of the styrofoam and the, the paper cups that we were having, and now we switched over to the mugs. Uh, we compost, uh, the compost bucket for the tea. Uh, we try to recycle paper. 
Uh, we have recycled glass. Recycled glass. We do um, instead of the bottled water, we now have the Brita uh, pitcher that's in the refrigerator, so people can have you know if they want cold water, they can have cold water. And, you know, and and I know the board also has been thinking of with a potential new building, what are then things that we can have in that building that would uh, add to this overall uh, environmentalism and, and ecology. So, you know, trying to be, have the building as green as possible. So it's metal roof, metal siding, uh, really thick insulation. Uh, we're talking about using low flush toilets, on-demand water heaters, uh, building the roof so eventually we can have solar panels on the roof um, and reduce, uh, have like LEDs or low efficiency or high efficiency uh, lights. Uh, even because there's talk of because we wanted more natural light, so we wouldn't have to have the lights on all the time. Uh, having uh, these solar tubes in the roof that would then disperse the light out, so during the daytime it would feel like the lights are on, but it's really the solar tubes. You know, and, and kind of doing these brainstorms of like our top ten things that we want that impact positively on that. You know, having a low carbon footprint and things like that, I think, is really important. You know, and, it, and it's nice that the the board is thinking of that because mm -hmm. I think that and that models for us like, oh yeah, I never thought about, you know, I, get, I have to replace my toilet at home. I never thought about having a low flush toilet. Um, so, yeah, uh, just, just, just some wonderful things and there's a lot more that we can brainstorm on, uh, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of time. So that's why I just wanted us to share one or two and I think the ones you all pick kind of encompass those others as well. So uh, next week, uh, we're moving on in the book. We're going into uh, the part of Buddhist countries in environmental trouble. Uh, Louise has given the Dharma talk and we'll be doing the discussion next week. Uh, and the, the topic is Thailand's ecology monks. Thailand's Ecology Monks. And just on a side note, uh, there is actually one in here about uh, Dharma Walk Around Som uh, Somkala Lake by our good friend Santakara Bhikkhu. And what page is that? Uh, so we are going to be on page 191. Santikara's is 206. So we're not going to be covering Santikara's, but I just thought. There's a nice little local connection there to this book. I think we should reach out to him and let him know we're doing this because he has a lot of good ideas and a lot of care for the environment. Well, and he gave a Dharma talk many years ago on Dharmic socialism. Um, and I would say reach, you know, go to our podcast um, site and actually find that because he, Buddhadasa Bhikkhu, the uh, kind of the head of their monastery that Santacaro, uh, came out of really was kind of this front edge leader of kind of, I don't want to say new thought, but just really challenging the status quo, you know, where our author this week talked about that change. Uh, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu was one of them that really was working kind of against that, or not, not against it, but really trying to get, bring balance back to lives. And, so I would say if, if you do have some time, you know, listen to that talk. It's, a, it's an interesting way. You know, I think sometimes people get scared with the word socialism, but it's all about kind of the social unity, you know, and kind of through the lens of Dharma. Um, all right, so let's, let's end with our dedication prayer.